Hi, everybody. Welcome to our monthly webinar on compliance. Thanks for joining us. My name is Leah Kelly, and I'm here with Shannon Wheeler, our general counsel. This is probably, what would you say, our sixth webinar we've done on compliance? Yeah. And we are compiling always on a new compliance-centric dedicated page on our website, so that will give you a convenient means to get to all of them from one page. So that's coming soon. Um, we've been hosting this webinar every month to give you a better sense of the different topics within compliance, show you what 10th Street can do to help you keep compliant, and let you know of any changes on the legal horizon, and ultimately help you avoid a lawsuit. That's our, that's our, our main goal. Today we're going to be covering and doing a deep dive into disclosures and authorizations. Shannon will lead the way by providing you with an overview of the FCRA, giving you a history of the standalone disclosure, the latest Ninth Circuit, Circuit Court of Appeals opinion that everybody's, it's all the buzz lately, how it affects you, and just talk you through best practices. So you know the webinar will be recorded and sent to you within the next 24 hours, and also you can feel free to submit questions at any time throughout the webinar. You can do so using the text box on your GoToWebinar control panel. We'll try to get to those right away, but if for some reason we don't, we will get to them at the end of the webinar. And with that, I will send Shannon on her way, her favorite slide. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Thank you, Leah. Hi, everyone. Happy to be here today talking to you about disclosures and authorizations. And the timing of this couldn't be more perfect because um, there was a recent a Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals opinion, which um, somewhat changed the law or further clarified the law in this area and um, uh, something that a lot of companies often had in their disclosures and authorizations that was really common to have in their disclosures and authorizations, the Ninth Circuit has now said, nope, you can't do that anymore. So um, the timing of this disclosure and authorization webinar is perfect. We're going to talk about that case and um, we're going to also give you guys um, some samples and um, provide the case if you're like me and you like reading uh, circuit court opinions um, and um, try to try to help you guys out as we go through um, these materials. We're going to um, provide sample language and um, notices of rights and the case and other things to help you out. So um, with that said, uh, my standard legal disclaimer, the following information is offered for educational information only, is not legal advice. I am an attorney, but I um, represent only 10th Street, and so um, nothing provided herein is legal advice um, and does not constitute an attorney-client relationship. As always, we at 10th Street recommend that you consult with qualified legal counsel on all of the issues, laws, and regulations that we talk about, and 10th Street expressly disclaims any warranties associated with this process presentation or the information provided herein. Okay, so what we're going to talk about today, um, this is kind of a broad overview um, of sort of our agenda. We're going to talk about the FCRA, just what it provides as it relates to um, disclosures and authorizations. Um, we're going to talk about the history, some previous case law um, with the standalone disclosure rules and what that means. Um, and then we're going to talk about this new Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals opinion called Gilberg versus California Check Cashing Stores. And of course, it um, is a California case. The Ninth Circuit covers California as well as several other states. Um, and then we'll talk about some best practices for your FCRA disclosure and authorization. We'll talk about a uh, what's called an investigatory consumer report disclosure. It's something that we are um, recommending um, to our clients. And we'll dive into that. We'll touch a little bit more on the 1681M disclosure. Um, we've talked about that on, before on previous webinars, but I want to make sure and get that information out there. Um, again, we're going to talk a little bit more about verbal OK, this um, idea, this, um, this way that you can get verbal authorizations, but also why it's not a good idea to get a verbal authorization, um, which is a trucking-specific um, regulation or law that allows for that. Um, and then we're going to talk about PSP and what disclosure and authorization you have to have if you order PSP. Um, we're going to talk about the drug and alcohol release and the state law disclosure. So essentially we're going to cover everything that um, it, it's a good idea to get up front um, with your applicants at the same time that you get the um, application, the full application. Okay, so let's dive into 
the next slide, which is just an overview of the Fair Credit Reporting Act. It was enacted in 1970. So if you think about 1970, that was long before, I think the internet may have just started right around that time, but it was long before everybody had computers in their homes and actively used the internet on a regular basis, especially like we do now. There wasn't this thing called smartphones that could um, do all the capabilities that we have now. Um, so the the law and its um, requirements sort of date back to the 1970s, and um, and and we're going to talk about that a little a little bit more when it comes to the verbal um, authorization. Um, it's regulated by the uh, Fair Trade Commission and the CFPB, and um, it allows for class action lawsuits against employers against anybody who has a claim under the Fair Credit Reporting Act. Um, and, and it has become, the FCRA has become one of the most contentious and expensive litigation areas for employers. Um, in 2018, the number of filed FCRA cases was up 60% over the prior year. Um, and I, the uh, attorneys that I've consulted with on this have said that in 2014, they predicted that FCRA cases would rise um, significantly, and they have year after year after year since 2014. Um, they just keep getting more and more and more. The allegations of these lawsuits focus on hyper-technical violations. So um, what this means is that you're, the most filed cases is on disclosure and authorization language. And that when I say hyper-technical violations, I mean that literally the language in the disclosure and authorization is incorrect or unlawful. That is the greatest percentage of FCRA cases are filed over disclosure and authorization language. The second number two risk is that um, employers don't follow the adverse action process. We actually did a previous webinar, was it two months ago? Yeah, yeah. Three, three. On um, the adverse action process. It is posted on our website and I would recommend you all um, watch it. It is, um, at, you need to have an adverse action process and in addition to um, having correct disclosure and authorization language because those are the two biggest things that cases, um, FCRA cases are brought. And because um, the FCRA allows class action lawsuits, the settlement for these cases are in the millions for willful violations. I can give you just a couple of um, examples of some scary cases that we saw in 2018. Um, one particular very well-known employer settled an FCRA class action lawsuit for $7.5 million. The allegations in that lawsuit were that the employer did not provide any disclosure and authorization at all prior to getting um, a consumer report. So um, that was a really big one. That was a really big violation and a really large settlement, $7.5 million. Um, another big named employer um, also settled a case um, last year in 2018 for five million dollars, um, and that um, case had the allegations were that they didn't have a standalone disclosure, that there was additional information in the disclosure um, that shouldn't be in there. And we're going to talk a lot about that today. Um, and so, you know, these cases, the 7.5 million and the five million dollar cases. The reason why those cases are so big is because they had a large number of applicants that they um, pulled background reports on with these disclosure and authorizations. And so it's unique to the trucking industry because there's a lot, it's the same way, there's a lot of applicants that come through. You're pulling a lot of consumer reports. Um, and so the greater number of consumer reports you're pulling on applicants, the higher your risk goes um, for these settlements to go higher and higher. So another really interesting thing about these class action lawsuits is that um, they tend to be filed by the same plaintiffs time and time again. Um, there was a study done, and I think it was like something like 500 of the plaintiffs that filed FCRA cases in 2018 had filed previous FCRA cases in previous years against um, other employers. So. Um, there, there's literally test plaintiffs that this is all they do for a job is go out and apply, see if the FCRA is violated, and then they go to the law firm. There's a 
couple of different law firms, but one in particular out of Florida that just likes doesn't do nothing but file these FCRA cases. So, okay, so uh, just again, broad overview. What is a consumer when we're talking about um, the Fair Credit Reporting Act? Um, we're uh, we're talking about consumer reports, a consumer. The consumer is the person you're running the report on. It is not the company that is getting the report. It's the individual or the applicant that you're pulling a consumer report on. And, and so a consumer report is any report that you get through a consumer reporting agency. It's not just credit. So an, um, an MBR, SID list, a background check or a criminal record check. Credit reports also fall under this. And then employment verifications fall under this if they're not obtained directly from the prior employer. If you go, um, you know, directly to the trucking company to get your employment verification, that would not be considered a consumer report. But if you use 10th Street and Exchange to get um, your employment verifications, that would be considered um, a consumer report. And so, uh, so all of these are considered consumer reports. And that's why the FCRA impacts the trucking industry in such a unique way, because not only do you have a high turnover, you have a high you know, um, number of applicants that are coming in, but because of the FMCSA regulations, you're required to pull an MDR. Um, and, uh, and oftentimes pull other reports like SID lists and background checks and do employment verifications because of these regulations. And so um, trucking companies are are always pulling consumer reports, which fall under the guise of the FCRA. Okay, so um, there's oftentimes com confusion about, well, you know, do I have to follow the FCRA or not? Um, and, and why, you know, I know that there are some provisions under the FCRA that you don't have to get a disclosure and authorization for, and, and if I'm hiring for specific reasons and not others. Well, if you are getting the consumer report for employment purposes, then you have to, FCRA requires three things. You have to provide the consumer, the applicant, with the FCRA summary of rights. You have to provide the consumer with a clear and conspicuous disclosure in writing consisting of solely of the disclosure. And it's that language that, uh, that's the actual language from the statute itself that gets in to a lot of this gray area, but that's where the, the Ninth Circuit and other courts get the language that it has to be a standalone disclosure it's because the statute says clear and conspicuous in writing consisting solely of the disclosure. So that's the FCRA disclosure. It used to be called an FCRA release in um, the industry. Um, I'm going to refer to it as an FCRA disclosure since that's how the cases, the courts, the FTC all refer to it. Um, and then, and this is key, um, under the FCRA, you have to obtain the consumer's authorization in writing. I'm going to refer to that as the FCRA authorization. So that's actually two different things. There's a disclosure and there's an authorization. Now, when I say obtain the consumer's authorization in writing, I do recognize that there is a verbal exception for the transportation industry. Um, that was Back in 1970, the trans when the law was enacted, the transportation industry specifically lobbied for this verbal exception because um, because of the nature of the job and that um, that applicants were out on the road and they weren't walking into a place filling out an application, which is how the law sort of presumed that um, that people transacted business and, and, and getting jobs and applying for jobs. But for the transportation industry, because a lot of it happened over the phone, they said, well, you will create a verbal exception. But they didn't, they didn't create, they said, you still have to follow all the same rules. It's just that you have to provide these notices for them um, verbally. So they didn't, they just allow you to, to get it verbally, but they, you don't get to provide them with less information because of it. And then one thing that's key is the the term for employment purposes is construed very broadly by courts. So if you're a carrier and you're pulling um, MBRs for an independent um, contractor, um, that is likely going to be considered for employment purposes. And you're still going to want, because of how broadly courts construe those terms, and you're still going to want to follow the FCRA. It does apply 
even if you're not hiring them as an employee, but if you're hiring them as a, as a contractor. Okay, so let's go into the standalone disclosure and what how the case law has proceeded. So in 2017, the Ninth Circuit Court in Syed versus MILLC um, said, <coughs> interpreted that statutory language and said that the FCRA disclosure must be in a document that consists solely of the disclosure. And they found that an employer acted willfully in violation of the FCRA when it included a liability waiver in the FCRA disclosure. Prior to the 2017 Ninth Circuit Court, it was fairly common for companies to include um, a sentence or a couple of sentences that said, you know, you release the company and the um, consumer reporting agency from any and all liability um, in connection with a background report that might be, you know, provided with this disclosure. They found that is absolutely 100% a violation of the FCRA, and that is what these companies are getting um, getting deemed for now on these big class action lawsuits. Um, and I think, I believe, yeah, that was what the $5 million settlement was for in 2018. I can tell you that we've done a search of our system and our disclosure and authorization language, and we have found words like liability and waiver in disclosure and authorization language of our current customers of ours right now that they're being that is being used in connection with their applications. So I encourage you all go look at your disclosure language. Make sure it does not use the words liability. Make sure it does not use the words waiver or waiver of liability um, or release, release of liability. That's the same sort of thing. So this is the big case that came out um, in 2017, and for the most part, other circuit courts have followed suit in finding um, in finding that you can't have these sort of um, liability waivers in your disclosure and authorization. Um, the other thing that was um, that came out um, after this uh, Ninth Circuit Court opinion is the FTC posted some guidance, and you can actually follow that link. Um, uh, there, it's a blog post by the FTC which says that background checks on prospective employees keep required disclosures simple. So what the FTC said here was that you need to have uh, get rid of the liability waivers and then also keep the wording at, that a prospective employee will see clear and easy to understand. They said no legal jargon, don't have overbroad authorizations. That's another thing that we've seen um, cases where um, you're releasing them to be able to pull and get any and all information. Uh, that is too broad, the courts have said, and I saw a case in 2018 um, settle for $1.2 million for, um, for that very language. They found that it was too broad um, of a of a disclosure that you had to give more clear um, uh, guidance to the employee on what exactly you were going to be pulling on them. So uh, in the next slide, yeah. I went ahead and posted that link into the chat for everybody oh. so you can just link right to it from there because I don't think they can click on this little slide. Oh, okay. perfect. Thank you. So, yeah, no problem. So on the next slide, these are other common violations. Um, most of these bullet points represent other cases that um, have been brought where the courts have found willful violation of the standalone disclosure requirement, and, um, and some of them were specifically set out in the FTC guidance um, in that blog post. So in particular, don't have any acknowledgement of employment policies. I think there was a case in 2017 that settled for like $2.4 million because the company had an acknowledgement of um, receipt of the employment handbook and, and certain employment policies. Um, we, I saw a company, a very large household name company, and I believe that case settled for $2.5 million, where they acknowledged in the disclosure that they were being provided a standalone disclosure. Um, it's clever, clever um, wording, probably by a lawyer somewhere, but you can't do that either, the court said. And, um, and that case ended um, with a pretty high settlement. 
Um, again, the broad authorization for any person to provide any and all information. That's too broad. Um, the courts don't like to see that. Um, your disclosure language um, should, should not have a certification by the applicant that the information in the application is accurate. Um, that should be separate and apart from your FCRA disclosure and authorization. Um, and if you are um, having a D if you have a DOT compliant application, you will have a certification that is required by the FMCSA regulations at the end of your application that is separate from your disclosure and authorization that provides that certification. So you don't need it in your disclosure and authorization as well, particularly if you use the Intel app. Okay, another big um, set of cases that came down, I can't remember what circuit it was in, but was um, you can't have an acknowledgement that the hiring practices of the employer are based on legitimate non-discriminatory reasons. The court said no to that as well. Um, again, corporate privacy and health information policies, that was found um, to be a, um, a violation. And then this is sort of a, a sticking point, um, this last bullet point, is an inclusion of blank spaces where the applicant is to record prior work experience. So that is a suggestion by the FTC, um, and I believe there was a case on it, but it was uh, it's sort of a sticking point for employers, like, well, wait, um, you know, we have to get that information about prior work experience. Here's the thing, get it on a different page. You just want to have a plain and simple disclosure um, that just has the information that's necessary, nothing else. So those are other common violations that have been found as it relates to making sure you have a standalone disclosure. Okay, now let's talk about this Ninth Circuit Court case, um, Gilbert versus California Check Cashing Stores. So the facts of the case are a plaintiff um, was uh, applied to work at this um, establishment and they were given, she was given a disclosure and provided, provided her authorization in writing. Um, in the uh, materials that we're going to give you, I'm actually providing you the case itself and the case itself goes through and, and um, has a copy of what the disclosure and authorization looked like. So you can actually go look at that language in the materials we're going to provide you today. Um, so the plaintiff signed off on and provided her authorization in writing. The employer then obtained a background check on this employee. She was hired and she remained employed at this employer for five months. She voluntarily left her position and then she filed a class action lawsuit. Um, in this case, the disclosure and authorization were combined. Um, and we're going to talk about best practices here in a minute. And while it is not unlawful to have your disclosure and authorization combined, we're going to talk about how it's the best practice to go ahead and separate those out. Um, but I just wanted to point that out here in talking about the facts of the case. And so what was a, a key point in this case was that um, in the disclosure, the FCRA disclosure, the document referenced several times state notices of rights. And prior to this case, it was fairly common for a company to reference in their disclosure, you know, New York applicants and employees only. And then it will, would have some language after, after um, that to sort of disclosing what the state law was or what a state required disclosure was um, if the applicant was from New York. There was also, um, you know, reference to California language. There was reference to Oregon language, things along those lines that the um, disclosure and authorization gave. And then it has the authorization, which authorized the company to pull a background check. The authorization also had state um, language in it. And then um, on the next slide, we'll kind of go through the court's ruling. So that's the basic facts of the case. There's obviously more detail than that that you can read in the 20-page um, California court opinion. But those are the, the highlights. Okay, so the court's ruling, the court explicitly said that notices of state rights combined with the FCRA disclosure violate that standalone disclosure requirement. The um, employer's uh, attorneys argued specifically that the state disclosures were closely related information that didn't violate the FCRA because it was all disclosures about um, the state-specific um, credit reporting acts and the state specific notices of rights, the court declined that argument and said no, 
these state notices can be confusing to consumers because many of those state notices are inapplicable to the consumer. The court said, um, even this related information can distract or confuse the reader. So the court made it very clear, no information beyond what is required by the SDRA should be in the SDRA disclosure. The court used the words, no surplusage, so keep it out, none whatsoever. And then the court made it clear that there are no exceptions to this rule. So you have to have, um, you have to have a very clear, plain disclosure with nothing else in it. Um, a couple of things that, actually, if you could go back to that slide, I wanted to point out that the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals opinion did say, um, and this is key, there have been several cases along the way that have decided this, and um, because of the Ninth Circuit, we were a little unsure how they were going to come down on it, but they backed it up, and they, they did say, you can have separate pages, you can present separate disclosures, separate notices on separate pages so that the, um, the plaintiff was arguing in particular that the application combined with the SDRA disclosure and other notices that are given on other pages uh, constitute one single document which violates the SDRA standalone disclosure. And the court said, no, that is not the case. It, you can present separate documents in connection with the application, but the FCRA disclosure has to be on its own page. In fact, the court specifically said it would be difficult to see how an employer could ever provide an applicant written application materials without violating the FCRA to standalone disclosure requirements, essentially if they couldn't present them on separate pages. So that was one thing that, that good that did come out of this court's ruling. So we now know that we, as long as everything is on its own page, um, it doesn't constitute the same document. Um, and so, uh, so everything needs to be presented on separate pages. Okay. So uh, I'd encourage you all to go take a look at that opinion. We're going to provide it to you if you like reading again. It's very insightful. Um, the Ninth Circuit actually does a pretty good job of writing a, a pretty clear opinion. So um, it, it could be very helpful. helpful. Um, one thing that we um, have recently um, rolled out as a recommendation for our clients is this investigative consumer report disclosure. So you're probably thinking, oh, what? Um, if, if you're not familiar with the FCRA, an F investigative consumer report is a type of consumer report prepared by a consumer reporting agency based on in-person interviews with third parties. Um, and so We've seen um, what we know, let, let me back up. We know that um, Section 391.23 of the FMCSA regulations require employees, employers to investigate an applicant's safety performance history within 30 days of hiring them. And so our con the concern that, that me and um, other lawyers in the industry have is that that investigation could be considered an investigative consumer report because you're oftentimes calling and getting employment verifications. You're doing an investigation through multiple different ways to get the safety performance history. Um, so with between the employment verifications, the drug and alcohol, and the accident violations, those three things together could likely be considered an investigative consumer report because this definition of an investigative consumer report is so broad. Um, and so our attorneys have seen more cases alleging that it's a violation to have that investigative consumer report disclosure in the SDRA disclosure. So it, before um, this recent case, it was fairly common to have, and I'm talking about the Ninth Circuit case, it was fairly common to have um, state disclosures um, in your disclosure and authorization, but it was also fairly common to have an investigative consumer report disclosure also combined with your FCRA disclosure. We're now saying, look, based on this Ninth Circuit court opinion, um, it just, it's, there's no exceptions. So, and the court made it clear there was no exceptions. So separate them out and have your own separate investigative consumer report disclosure presented on a separate page. Because just like the court confirms, you can have as many pages as um, necessary, it just has to be separate from the FCRA disclosure on a separate document. There also is an FTC opinion, which says um, 
that yes, the investigative consumer report, some of it can be in the um, in the FCRA disclosure, but some of it, you know, can't be. So we just think best practice, present the investigative consumer report disclosure on its own separate page. Include a list of your consumer reporting agencies and, um, and who you're going to use to investigate the safety performance history of the applicant. Um, and then you can also, it's, it's a good idea to include the contact information for the company representative at your um, company for an applicant to contact to get information about what has been done in conducting this investigation. You don't have to have that, but it really is a best practice to have. So that's what the investigative consumer report disclosure is. And um, as I think Leah um, will provide to you all, we're going to give you all some sample language, both the sample disclosure language, sample authorization language, and sample investigative consumer report disclosure language that you can um, that you can look at, adopt, and um, uh, and use um, uh, as your own if if you so choose. Great. Yes, I'm going to share that with you at the end of the webinar, along with a couple of links to some blogs that we've written to that are helpful. And there's a question that came in. I thought it would be a good time to take a break for a question. Sure. Um, th this person works has a division that has its release forms written in English, but they sometimes say we'll hire someone in a French-speaking location. And so they work with their translator from their company to go over it with the candidate, but then they sign the English form based on what was translated to them. So they are wondering if they're in violation by not having a French written disclosure form. That is such a good question, <laughs> and um, we've actually come up. Well, I haven't. I haven't ever specifically come across a case um, that deals with this, but I, I get these questions often because, and it's usually not French. It's actually usually Spanish, but um, but it's interesting. And so, um, yeah, this is this is a really difficult sort of uncertain area of the law. Um, and so I, I have, I mean, there's a couple of, of, of issues with that. One, um, there is, the best practice would be, yes, to provide them with the authorization, the disclosure authorization in their language. And, but if they, if they can speak English, if they can understand English, um, or if they, um, you know, say they can and, or say they understand it, those would be good things to document. Um, and then, um, you know, emailing or providing them the disclosure in, in the language that they speak and understand would be the absolute best practice. Um, but if they, um, you know, say they can understand it enough, then you can get it in, um, get it in English and they find it in English. Um, it, there also is sort of this interesting thing in the trucking industry. The FMCSA requires that um, as a qualification to be able to drive um, a truck, you, the, the driver has to be able to understand and read English well enough to drive on um, United States roads. So, you know, you can also rely on that regulation to say that, you know, this driver's qualified enough to read English is to be able to drive on the roads. They're qualified enough to, you know, read English um, for the disclosure authorization. Um, and then the last thing is, is there is this verbal exception um, for trucking companies. And while I'm going to have a whole slide on why I don't recommend that, if you're reading it to them um, in their native language and they provide their authorization, you definitely, over the phone, um, you're going to want to provide, make sure you provide all the information that you're required, which we're going to cover um, on one of our slides coming up here, um, in their native language. And then if they provide that verbal authorization, you're going to want to make sure you note that you provided them it, to them verbally over the phone um, in their native language and that they gave their authorization. It's not a best practice, but it is a way to get around it. So those are three sort of things in, in answering that question. Okay, thanks. All right, um, so let's touch on 1681M. Um, all right, 1681M, we talked about this before, but it's been several months. It is an additional transportation-specific notice that carriers are required to give drivers who um, apply by mail, telephone, or computer. Um, 
And so we have seen in the last probably four years, plaintiff's attorneys targeting carriers for the 1681M notice. And um, it you don't have to call it a 1681M notice. You just have to give them this information. We call it a 1681M notice because that's the particular location of the statute that, uh, that this language is at. Um, I also wrote a blog post went like in July-ish mm-hmm, of so. last year um, on our, the 10th Street blog, when I think Lee is going to provide you a link to that, about 1681M, and it has the specific details of the cases and of the um, statutory requirements of this. But um, mm. So what it is, is it's a disclosure that you have to provide that says the name and the contact information of the consumer reporting agencies that you're going to use to obtain consumer reports. And then it gives the applicant notice of their right to obtain a free copy of their consumer report, notice of the right to dispute the completeness or accuracy of the information with the consumer reporting agency that provided that report, and a statement that the consumer reporting agency will not be the one making any decisions to take adverse action. And so we also will have sample language that includes a 1681M that you can um, choose to adopt if you would like that we're going to provide you. Um, But one thing to note on the 1681M, we had a lot, uh, the companies in the cases each time argued, courts, you know, we provide them with all these other notices. You know, why do we have to provide them with this specific notice? And the, the court just completely refused that argument and said, we don't care. This is you have to provide this notice in addition to the other notices that you're required to give. So um, if you're hiring drivers that will be subject to the DOT regulations, this notice you're going to want to give to them because it's specifically required for transportation. And this also falls under the <coughs> excuse me the verbal author the verbal you have to provide them with all of this information verbally if you're going to follow the verbal exception, which I mean, you'd just be talking. I mean, it includes all of the contact information, the address, the telephone number. So you would just be talking, 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 talking to provide them this information plus the others that we're going to go over. So this is just one more thing that you'd have to make sure you provided them over the phone if you were going to do that verbal exception. All right, so let's talk about some best practices for your FCRA disclosure and authorization. Um, Make sure it is simple and easy to read. You want language that an everyday person Um, An everyday applicant will be able to understand no fancy legal language. Um, You only want to disclose that a consumer report will be obtained and disclose what may be included in the consumer report. And you can see that sample language that we give. No extraneous information. That means no um, waivers of liability, no information about employment policies, nothing other than what is required in the statute. Now, as of the Ninth Circuit case, no reference to any state. Um, Any notice or disclosure of state law, you're going to want to take that out of your disclosure and authorization language. Obviously, no waivers of liability and no acknowledgement of employment policies. And then we recommend that you have the authorization on a separate page. And the reason for that is, is if you have the disclosure and authorization on the same page, which the law allows for, but you and you can do, but if you have it on the same page and you have something in your authorization that the court might find um, extraneous or unnecessary, then that authorization could get you in trouble with the standalone disclosure requirement. So you want to have the authorization on a completely separate page presented on a separate screen. Um, okay, so here let's talk about the um, verbal exception in the trucking industry. So, like I said, back in 1970, when this law was being written, the transportation industry lobbied to have this specific um, exception. And it was historically because it was difficult in the industry at the time to obtain a signature. That reason no longer exists. There are smartphones. We know that, what is it, Leah, like 70% of applicants apply? 72, 70, it keeps on increasing every month that we look at it, so... The applicants apply on smartphones, and you can, um, through our system in particular with the Intel app, get you can get signatures on all the disclosures that you need um, right from the driver on their smartphone. Um, so the the reason for this exception really is a lot less applicable now. Um, so if you were going to follow the verbal authorization, 
you would have to read all of the following information. The FCRA Summary of Rights. That is a four-page document you would have to read word for word. You would have to read the disclosure to them. You would have to read the 1681M, including all the contact information I gave them. And you would have to get their authorization um, and make sure that it was a yes and not just a, oh, okay, or an, uh, you know, you'd, yes, it'd have to be a yes every single time. So why is this not a good idea? Well, for one, it makes you a bigger target. We saw between 2017 and 2018, 15 carriers, I think, um, be sued for this specific issue. They, the driver alleged, hey, you didn't give me um, a disclosure and authorization. And every single one of them, the carrier said they gave them a verbal. Well, um, it then becomes an issue of proof. It's the carrier's, um, you know, evidence against the drivers, and the carriers in that case would have to prove that each and every time they, before they filed an application, uh, or before they pulled a consumer report, before they pulled an MVR, they have to say that they read each and every one of these things, um, and that they got the, the actual authorization, that the driver said yes. Um, and so uh, so that's very hard to prove if you're not recording each and every one. Um, you can do it. it. Companies can do it, but it's just not a very good idea when it's much, much easier to just get a signature. Also, um, certain states prohibit um, getting a verbal authorization. California is one. Um, so you cannot, if you're hiring a driver out of California, you cannot give them the um the verbal authorization, you cannot get a verbal authorization. And there are other states as well. So, um, you know, you'd have to be really careful about it. And then it's not valid you can't, for PSP or for SIDLIS. You can't get uh, PSP without a written disclosure and authorization, and the same with SIDLIS. So just a much better idea, um, get, it, get it the um, disclosure and authorization in writing. Don't rely on this verbal authorization. Um, it's simple, it's easy through our system to get. You can even do it while you're on the phone with them. Talk them through it. They can, you know, put the phone on speakerphone and sign away. You can send them the link. Um, it's, not, it's not as difficult now to get a signed uh, disclosure and authorization. And then we've got a question here also. So if they are using the Intella app, they want to know if all of their disclosures and authorizations are written in the way that we're talking about here today. Maybe, maybe not. So, um, that's a great question. I'm glad you asked it. The way our system works is the compliance is yours. You own the um, the application. You own the compliance. And so um, it, we set it up how you asked for us to set it up. And um, so you'll want to go through and look at your disclosure and authorization in connection with your Intel app. There's an easy way to do that. And you can just click through the back end of, of your Intel app. And so contact your um, account manager. Um, and, or client services and and have them walk you through it so you can actually see what's there. Um, if you want to update the language to our sample language, if you want to adopt that and use that, I would highly um, recommend you at the very least do that. Even better, contact an FCRA attorney. But if you want to adopt our language, contact your account manager, tell them you want um, our sample disclosure and authorizations, and they will get that put in place for you. Um, these that we're providing you today are new, recent rolled out disclosures and authorizations. So um, they are the, the most up to date as of what was that last week, Leah, that we rolled mm -hmm. out? Yeah. Last so week. I would highly encourage you all to, um, if, you're, if you're not gonna have an FCRA attorney, look at these specifically. Um, look at look at the language you have. Look at the language we're providing in this sample, and um, adopt something similar. Or um, yeah, make make sure that it's it's compliant with what we're talking about today. Okay. And then there's a question: If they're doing an application over the phone, is there a way to just send them the disclosures to sign? I do believe there is. Um, and the absolute best person to talk to about that would be your account manager. Um, they can while you're on the phone with them, walk you through the best way to do that um, and, and how easy that can be uh, to do with our system. Yeah, everyone's set up a little bit differently, but there is a way to do that. It's, it doesn't cost you anything at all. It's just a different way of sending out an application for a signature. 
So yeah, work with your account manager. Um, like I said, they're all a little slightly different. So I don't want to tell you just one standard way. It might not apply to you, but work with your account manager or a client services team um, to let so they can show you how to do that. Great questions, guys. Yeah, thank you. Okay. So I want to talk a little bit about PSP. Um, uh, that's the Pre-Employment Screening Program with the FNCSA. And so we have a lot of our carriers um, that get PSP through us. Um, Tensory is an industry service provider. And um, if you want, we can um, set you up and you can order PSP directly through us, which will be delivered into the dashboard. PSP provides uh, the most recent five years of crash data for a particular um, applicant the most recent three years of roadside inspection data, and that comes from the FMCSA NCMIS database. And then um, it displays the carrier for which the driver was operating when the um, inspection or the crash occurred, um, and then also uh, the location and date of those, of those things. So um, it'll also give any additional safety details if it exists like injuries, fatalities, tow away, things along those lines. Um, so I mentioned this in this webinar because there is a specific PSP written disclosure and authorization that you have to get um, that the FMCSA requires that you have prior to ordering PSP. Um, they, if you use 10th Street, we have that specific disclosure and authorization language, but there's really no change in what it can say. The FMCSA requires that it, it be very specific wording, that it give a very specific written disclosure, and that you get a written authorization from the driver. Um, and so, um, so that's why I included in this. You, you have to have that in writing. You cannot get that verbally. And then you have to keep um, that written disclosure and authorization on file um, for so many years. And it is subject to audit by the FMCSA if they uh, um, want to come in and make sure that you're getting that. And um, so, yeah, that's PSP. And, and you have to have a, a specific written disclosure and authorization for that. Okay, and then the other um, release um, that, that as uh, trucking companies you, you want to make sure you get, and that's what is often in the industry referred to as the drug and alcohol release, um, but what it really is is it's the authorization to perform the investigation of the driver's safety performance history under 391.23. And I know we've talked a little bit about this, actually we've talked quite a bit about it on some of our other webinars. Um, so even though it's broadly referred to as a drug and alcohol release, it's not just drug and alcohol, even though it, it does include that. So you want to disclose to the applicant that you will um, obtain the following information, employment verifications, accident history, and drug and alcohol violations pursuant to um, 49 CFR 382. And so I believe that the sample language we're giving them also includes sample drug and alcohol release language. Um, you want to make sure you tell them that you're getting both pre-employment drug screening as well as any other um, drug screening um, that occurred during their employment um, with prior employers. You want to tell them you're getting employment verifications, which can include um, dates of employment, you know, information about the reasons for termination, um, all of the details about their previous employment, as well as um, any accident history. And a lot of times, um, you know, drivers don't understand that accident history can include any and all information that a prior carrier wants to provide. It doesn't um, have to be just um, FMCSA recordable accidents. It can be any any kind of accidents, even little um, you know bumps and um, things that um, that drivers oftentimes don't think are a big deal. You, they can provide those um, in an employment verification that's allowed um, under the uh, regulation in 391.23. So you want to make sure you disclose that information. And then you also want to make sure that you provide the applicant with um, a notice of the following rights. And this is required by statute, that they have a right to request the information provided by the previous employer. They have a right to have errors in the information corrected. And they have a right to add, have a rebuttal statement attached to their report that will stay with that report um, as long as it's being reported, stay with that information as long as it's being reported. So that's the drug and alcohol release. Um, again, we have sample language if you want to look at it. Okay, so 
Um, moving on, summaries of rights. So uh, you absolutely want to always provide applicants with their FCRA summary of rights if you use our system. Um, it's the first thing that um, the applicant will see after they sign their employment application. You, if you if you use the Intella app, this is just automatically presented. We update it. We keep it updated as it gets up. As it, you know, this is actually a, a form document that the CFPB puts out, um, and it has to be provided just like they put it out. And um, uh, it was updated in September of 2018, I believe, and we instantly updated it. So. Um, to use our system, it's up, it's there, it's presented to the applicants, it's the first thing they see right after they sign their application. And then these are the following states that have state summaries of rights that are you're required to give applicants these summaries of rights. California, San Francisco, Washington, Philadelphia, Massachusetts, New York, and New Jersey. And so um, the way our system works, if you use 10th Street, is um, we will present these summaries of rights based on uh, either the applicant's residence, so when they fill out the Intel app and they put in their residence, if they're a resident of California, um, we will sh automatically show this state summary of rights at the end of when they're looking at their releases um, because we say, hey, they're from California, they're required to get this notice, and we give it to them. Same thing, if they live in San Francisco, we'll present the California and the San Francisco. If an employer, um, let's say, if an employer's home office is in Washington, uh, but the driver is applying in California, it's sort of ambiguous um, in the law as to whether they are required to get the Washington notice since that's where the employer is, or they're required to get the California notice since that's where their residence is, or if they're required to get both. So what we do is we present both. So uh, we would present in that situation both the California notice and the Washington notice, and if they were in San Francisco, we would present the San Francisco one as well. So our system automatically knows where the driver is applying from based on what they put in as their residence, and then where the um, home office or the location of the um, of the employer is and we'll show those notices. One of the new notices that we've rolled out is the Philadelphia notice that was just updated with our system within the last couple of weeks. Um, so that's the state notices. I believe we're also providing sample language for all of these. If, if you use our, our system, this is the notices that will be shown in our system. If not, you've got some sample notices of rights that you can provide your applicants. Okay, so um, things to remember from to do from this webinar. Have an FCRA attorney review your hiring practices and procedures. This is a very contentious area of the law. Um, we don't want to see our, our carriers sued. We don't want to see any of our clients sued by an FCRA lawsuit, at the very least. Um, they're very expensive to defend, even if they are defensible. Um, it doesn't hurt to have someone review their, your stuff. That, that lawyer cannot be me, but we can give you um, the names of some very good FCRA attorneys that um, can help you out with this. Um, if you're not going to have an FCRA attorney look at your hiring practices and procedures, go look at your disclosures and authorizations. Do it today. Do it soon while you're thinking about it. Make sure that it, your disclosure is presented on a separate screen from your other notices. Make sure that there's no reference to state law whatsoever in either your disclosure or your authorization. Make sure there's no reference to anything like waiver or liability or things like handbook or acknowledgement of you know, employment policy, anything like that. You'll also want to look at your CRA list and make sure it's updated specific for the 1681M um, and to look at and think about strongly, think about um, adding an investigative consumer report disclosure. Add a 1681M notice if you don't already have one. That's key. That is absolutely required if hiring drivers. And then make sure your drug and alcohol um, release is up to date and make sure that it provides the drivers a notice of their rights within that release. All right. We made it. That was a mouthful. <laughs> I know this is a full three hours. Really appreciate you all listening. I hope you found some really um, helpful tips.
um, in, in updating these things. I, um, I really like doing these and I love that, um, that we get lots of people attending them. So um, if you have any questions, feel free to write in. Yep, we've got a here. We've got a couple right here. Um, I am also though going to share with you four different blogs that we have too that just provide some more information on the nice the Ninth Circuit raising the bar with the new FCR disclosure. There's something about the uh, 1681M notice that PSP and other just a general one about is your company compliant and things that you can just a checklist that will help you kind of determine what you need to change or what you need to do differently. Um, to make sure that you stay compliant. So I'm sending those right now. Uh, there's also the handouts that we mentioned earlier. There's four handouts up there that you can download. So you should see these that in the handouts section, and you should see the links that I just provided in the chat section. So I'm sending that right there. And then let's go look at a question. Before we get to questions, I just want to give a shameless plug for our user conference registration. Um, tomorrow, guys, is the last day to register. So if you have not registered for our user conference yet, um, it's on the website. Register. It's going to be at the beautiful Venetian Hotel in Vegas, um, April 25th and 26th. I will be there doing a breakout session on compliance. I can't wait. Um, can't wait to go. It's going to be so great. I'm finally going to get to meet um, a lot of people uh, from the industry and a lot of our clients. But we're going to have a lot of things like um, industry education, um, insights from our CEO, Tim Crawford. We're going to have um, inputs on, uh, if, if you're there, you will get some input on our products and specifics into our software. Um, and then we're also going to give the people at um, that come to the user conference a first look into some of our new um, products that we're going to be rolling out soon thereafter. So it's going to be really exciting. Tomorrow is the last day, absolute final day cutoff is tomorrow. So go register for the user conference. You can do that on, on the website as well. Um, or talk to your AM or advisor or salesperson, lots of different ways. Okay. So thanks, Shannon. So... <laughs> Some questions about the state notices. This one's about the state notices. And what if you have several locations in different states? So how does 10th Street know which one is the home office and determine what state notice to send? Great question. So um, we will use, I believe, and, and um, it could be set up differently for your application. So what I'm going to tell you is just sort of the general way we do it. But um, you might have had this set up with your um, particular AM in a different way. So talk to your AM to get specifics about how you're set up. But the, what my understanding is is that we will use the um, address that is on the application itself and to determine where the job location is. So um, like if the app, if you look at your application, especially in your Intel app, it has to have the DOT requires that you have the, the name and address of the carrier that you're applying to. So we use that address to determine, okay, this carrier is in Washington. We need to show the Washington Notice of Rights. But um, what if you want, we can turn on certain state summary of rights to show all the time. So, um, for example, if you have... Um, you know, some locations in Massachusetts, for example, um, and that's not the address that shows up on your Intel app, we can show that Massachusetts summary of rights every time. Contact your AM, they can set you up to do that. And then it will also use, just to add on to that, it will also use the state that the driver has put into his application, which was said earlier, but just to be clear. So it will use all, it will use both the one on the application and the one that the driver has indicated is his state of residence. Awesome. Okay. Let's Great questions else. this webinar. Yeah. This one is about the verification. She's asking if they can, uh, if the owner's out of business, if the company's out of business, is it okay to do a verbal whenever you're talking to, if you get a hold of the if the owner by their cell phone or some other way, she's, then can you do a verbal at that point? Okay, so um, not 100% certain what we're asking here. You can get employment verifications verbally. Mm -hmm. um, so, so if that's the question, yes, you yes. can do that. You can contact um, prior employers if they are out of business, but you get a hold of them. You can do that, get an employment authorization, or I'm sorry, employment verification verbally, and that doesn't relate to the verbal authorization from the driver 
to get um, to get to pull a consumer report. But but let me I just want to add an additional note here. It's a good question because that is the exact reason. Ooh, I almost spilled my water. Sorry about that, guys. Um, that's the exact reason why you want to get that investigative consumer report disclosure because the investigative consumer report disclosure, if you that phone call, that employment verification over the phone would be considered an interview, which would fall under the investigative consumer report disclosure, um, which is why you want to provide that to the driver separately from the other FCRA disclosure and authorization. So that's exactly the reason why we highly recommend you get the investigative consumer report disclosure. Okay. And I'm going to wait for a few minutes, though, or just a few seconds, and see if anybody else has any questions. We're wrapping up here. It was a very kind of straightforward, this one. You know, there, there aren't a lot of – it doesn't seem like there's a lot of gray area. It's pretty – Well, uh, that's the – that's the hope. That's the desire. Yeah. The, the the truth is is that there's a lot of litigation that occurs on disclosure and authorizations, um, and it's mainly because people uh, just these hyper technical violations that yeah. we've talked about, and we just want to make sure that it is um, that that you make it as clear as possible because they're easy things to fix and something that um, you know we would hate to see any of our carriers end up in a lawsuit about because it's easy fixes. So. Um, you know, you just have to go look at it. Oftentimes, these disclosures and authorizations have been in place for years and years and years, and you haven't um, thought about going and revisiting them. So, um, this is something you definitely want to take a look at. Definitely. And make sure you download those handouts. I don't see any more questions coming through, but I just wanted to make sure that you did download the handouts that we had and link to those blogs so you can read more about this information, become more well-versed in it so that you feel more confident about you being compliant as well as talking to any lawyer that you have as well. Um, Great. Well, thank you, everybody. I really appreciate you all tuning in and listening and um, hope to see you in Vegas. Yeah. Thanks so much, everybody. Have a great day, a great weekend, and we'll see you soon. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.